meet at 7 o'clock. There is a meeting here um, to talk about the Sunday School and our plans for next year for the Sunday School. And Tuesday night at 7 o'clock is Bible study. And after Randy's sermon last week, he's going to get about seven phone calls for people that want to join Bible study. Bible so, discussion. Pardon? Bible discussion. Bible discussion. And for those of you that think, those of us that go, know anything about what's in the Bible, you're sadly mistaken. So don't feel if I don't know even where certain books are in the Bible, I can't go to this thing. That's where the index is, or Randy will tell you where it is. So don't let that deter you from, from joining our little group. And nobody else, nobody has any announcements. We have our heifer jar. If you have spare change in your pockets or purses, that would be good. Um, and Lisa, are you doing? Are we doing the? No, they 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 paused collection for the. Uh, I did send off um, some big Y cards to the Center for uh, New New Americans over in Northampton. They are much in need of things like that, so um, they're always very appreciative. And I sent um, Vicki Palmer uh, cards earlier uh, in this, this spring. So we should be all set on that. But if anyone wants to donate, that's always a good thing. That's it. OK, so now we'll turn the service over to Anthony for a prayer. I will say of my redeemer.
Thanks, Anthony. And I, I think Irene didn't want to mention it because she is the donor, but the flowers today on the altar are offered by Irene, and they are beautiful. So thank you very much, Irene, for the flowers. My neighbor gave me two orchids a couple of years ago, and I don't have the guts to tell her they're both dead already. Uh, so it's really nice to see these beautiful orchids up here. Whoever you are, and wherever you may be on your own life's journey, you are welcome here at Sunderland Congregational Church, or probably United Church of Christ. And one of the themes of today's worship is that we have a good God uh, that sometimes we just fail to recognize His presence, His nearness, uh, but He is there. And when you can't count on anything else, anybody else, God is always there. I want to share just a little quick story. I go to donate blood on Thursday over Cooley Dickinson. The uh, Mass General Blood Mobile comes out. And so I went to donate blood. And so I've got the, the needle and my precious blood is flowing into a bag. And, and the guy across the aisle on the bus, um, he's a hunk. I'm just sorry, he's a hunk. He looks like one of those guys that'd be on the cover of like a romance novel. He's got the wavy long hair and everything else. Come to find out, he's an ER doctor inside the hospital. So besides being an ER doctor and a good looking guy, I mean, I could have just disappeared. Like nobody was giving me any attention with this guy next to me. And so I got my blood flowing out of me and everybody's talking to this guy. Everybody's concerned about this guy. One of the uh, phlebotomists even says, well, I bet you the women come in and go, oh, I'm not feeling well, doctor, just so she, you know, he can take care of her and all that. And so when you've got no one paying attention to you, as your precious blood is flowing into a bag, as no one is paying attention to you, when you can't see anybody else around who cares, there's always God. And so that was just kind of a light example. But that message is true. No matter what, there's always God. And we're going to try to tie into that in today's worship as one of the themes. So with all of that said, uh, let us now... Uh, we're going to turn to our opening hymn and candle lighting, and if you are able, I invite you to please stand. It's O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, Red Hymn number 223. us and knows us. God knows when we sit down and when we rise up. God is always aware of us. God searches our paths and knows our ways. God's gaze is constantly watching over us. This is not to be feared. Before a word is on our tongues, God knows it. God's hand is ever available to guide us when the way ahead is uncertain. Not escape from God's presence. God is everywhere. Count this as a blessing of God's nearness, wherever we are. And now coming together for our unison prayer here in person, those online, and also later those through FCAT, our unison prayer. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Test us and know our thoughts. 
we gather with eager longing to know you better, our ever-present God, and to be known by you. We want to live as your people. Assure us in this time together, as the church at worship, that you hear our prayers and remember our faces. What a blessing to venture so close to the creator and sustainer of all that is. Fill our dreams and our waking hours with a hope that transcends our own desires. May every chance of divine encounter move us toward awe and reverence. May times of dedicated worship help us to then recognize your presence also in the ordinary. Build our trust in you, O oh God, so that we may be led in your everlasting way throughout our lives. Amen. Scripture is Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 19, page 22 in your Pew Bible. Jacob's dream at Bethel. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth and on top of it reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from this sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at first. So I was going to tell the kids in person, but maybe it'll be some on FCAP. Um, the game of hide and go seek. Every kid knows hide and go seek. And the thing is, if you're playing hide and go seek and you're the seeker, the game kind of slows down if you don't really go seeking with a lot of gusto. And I, uh, I don't know if I would have told the kids or not, but when I was uh, a young parent, uh, my wife went off to work. I was a pastor, so I was at home. I was like Mr. Mom. And when it got to be a little bit of a long day, we'd play hide and go seek. I really wouldn't go seeking all that quickly. I'd let them kind of go off and hide and be somewhere quiet for a while. And, you know, it wasn't the fair way to play the game, but that's the way we used to play hide and go seek. 
So you can't really play hide and go seek if the seeker doesn't seek. And that's what I wanted to kind of get across to the children, is that in the game of hide and go seek, God's not hiding from us, but God can be hidden from us. And the way that God is hidden is we just don't give him any attention. We don't pay attention to the things of God. We only are concerned about the things in the world. And so that's why really church is so important. Church breaks that, that routine of the world. It, it gives the, the kids or us adults, it gives us a chance to, to break out of only thinking about what we need to do for our bodies, for our living, for our incomes or whatever. It gives us a chance to just pause and to think about the things of God, to go seeking for God. And that's the story that we just heard. You know, Jacob is in a pretty rough spot in his life, and he, he takes off, and he's got a lot on his mind, and he, he goes to bed, and, and then he, he has this dream about this ladder up and back and forth to God, and there's angels ascending and descending, and you know, the, it's only imagery. I really don't think of a ladder as the best way to get to heaven, and you know, oftentimes you think about angels, and they've got wings, they don't need to climb up and down a ladder with wings, so it's just an image. We don't need to really concentrate on the image so much, but the message is that Jacob, when he was so desperate, and he forgot about seeking God, God found Jacob and gave him the chance to realize, as he says today, I'm standing beside you, and wherever you go, I'll be there for you. And so our job, God is not hiding, but he's hidden. Our job is to go seek God. And church is important for that. Sunday school is important for that. Good acts are important for that. Prayer is important for that. Bible studies we talk to, just Bible reading is important for that. But we have to make time to go seek God. And when we do go to seek God, He will allow Himself to be found. And we'll have our own Bethel, our own house of God, our own place where heaven and earth touch. And those are sacred places and sacred moments. And I hope whether you're a child or an adult, that they mean something to all of us. So Bethel. House of God. Our special music today is How Can I Keep From Singing? <laughs>
Thanks, Anthony. Sorry about your summertime cold. It's now time for us to share in our prayers, our joys, our celebrations, our concerns. So we continue to pray for Ukraine. And you know, now another additional tragedy is that they've bombed that seaport where a lot of the grain from both Russia and Ukraine is going out into the world, especially to uh, nations down in Africa where it is so much needed. And so that may come to a screeching halt and just add more pain to the world. So we pray for an end to that violence in Ukraine. We continue to pray for our nations. We face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. And prayers for all in the world who are suffering through historic heat and climate change, and also for all those communities affected by flooding that has hit our region. And I guess you all must have seen the news um, on Friday from the storms. Uh, Conway was blocked off for a while on 116. Uh, Deerfield, old Deerfield, were really hit hard. Uh, my wife works up at Eagle Brook, and they had to send them home early because I think it's Pine Nook Road. Pine Nook Road. Pine Nook Road got washed out, and that's going to be a long-term fix before that's that's uh, repaired. Um, something like six, seven, or eight inches fell in that afternoon. Uh, so definitely things are changing, and we pray for all the people who've been affected by it. And I offer special prayers for the farmers. I've talked to more than a few, and they can't even get out into their fields. And that's their livelihood. It's also going to affect eventually the price of what we pay at the grocery store. Uh, but really, they're, they're suffering so much, and so we pray for all those who've been affected so drastically uh, by this climate change that we're in. I'd also like to offer special prayers for uh, healing for Stanley, uh, who is in hospice care right now, and also prayers for Richard, uh, who will be undergoing some cancer treatment. So prayers for both Stanley and Richard on my behalf. Uh, are there any prayers that you guys would like to share? Joys or celebrations, concerns, anything? Sure. I just want to share Jeff had his uh, uh, MRI two weeks ago and we met with his oncologist and everything's really stable. So we'll have one more six month MRI and one more that's good that he can start to go to every year. So every six months. So it's good news. Oh, that's wonderful to hear, Jen. Thanks for sharing that. Tell them, tell them we're all happy for them. All right. Anything else, anybody? Uh, anybody from at home? Anything from there? Oh. Any prayers, Gail? Oh, okay. All set? Okay. So let us turn to our yellow sheets for our prayers. Let us pray for Alan, Alice, Antonia, and family, Art, Barbara, Bill, Bill, Bonnie, Carrie, Cheryl, Cindy, Denise, Evelyn, Frank, Frank, Grayson, Hayden, Jeff, John, John, Kathy, Kevin, Lauren, Marcia, Martha, Mary Jane, Michelle, Mike, Paula, Pauline, Pruitt, Bart, Sabrina, Sandra, Cheryl, Steve, Thelma, Virginia, and Richard, Wink, victims of violence anywhere in the world, those affected by natural disasters around the globe, and we pray for peace on earth. And may we now, after all of those shared prayers, may we turn inward for just a few moments of silence in the midst of our worship to offer God those prayers that we just don't feel comfortable saying out loud. So just a few moments of silence. ever-present Savior, before whom each of us is fully known, and before whom we open ourselves to your abiding presence, inspire us so that we may know better who we are and what we are to do as one of your followers. May our lives be clearly defined by our faith. May we not hide our faith, but live our faith. May we stand out in the world as different because we imitate the different priorities and rewards lived by Jesus. Help us to grow in our own faith and also to serve you by seeing the holy importance of our neighbors who are both near and far, and may our examples lead others to discover God in their lives too. And we ask also that you hear our prayers, whether they've been said out loud or silently, and that you answer them as you alone 
know best. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And may we now share together in the recitation of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus gave to all of us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Each and every one of us is indebted to God, who has given us life and everything that surrounds us. We are created in God's image. We are created of good seeds that will bear fruit of God's realm. We have the ability to dream, and hopefully to envision a better world than the one that we are in now, free of the unnecessary limitations that have weighed us down in the past. We can and we must do better. Through our offerings, we give support to this hope and to this Christian ministry of building upon the foundation established by Jesus and continued now through his church. Therefore, may our contributions be as generous as our faith expects and as our conditions in life allow. And we will accept your donations now. And if you are joining us either on FCAT or through Zoom, they also may be mailed to the church. However you donate, it is appreciated. gifts now be placed in your sanctuary as a symbol of our love for you and for all others. We're going to soon hear the gospel parable about the weeds growing with the, the wheat. And the message there is that sometimes they're indistinguishable and that Jesus says if we try to pull out the weeds and we also kill the wheat. The message being also that we are in competition in the world. We hopefully being the good of God and other forces that are opposed to that good. So we, in that competition, Churches are so important. They strengthen us. They give us an oasis. They give us a cause where we can come together and hopefully make a difference. Your being here, your worship, 
your donations help us to continue that battle for God's good in the world. So may God bless you for your continuing support of this church. May God bless these donations to his purpose and all these things we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And our reflecting hymn today is from Blue Hymn number 451, Be Still My Soul. Today's gospel is taken from Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, and then 36 through 43. And Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and poured grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to a master, did you not sow seed, good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? And he answered, an enemy has done this. And the slave said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no. In gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, 
Correct the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then he left the crowds and he went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, Explain to us this parable of the weeds of the field. And Jesus answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be accepted to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. You know, I, I guess I must dream at night when I'm sound asleep, but those are the dreams I don't know because I'm sound asleep. The dreams I tend to remember are the ones when sleep comes hard. You know, you fall asleep for a little bit, you wake up, you fall back to sleep, you wake up again. Those are the dreams that I remember. And those are the dreams that in-between state where you're like somewhat asleep and somewhat awake. And they're really strange because they blur that line that distinguishes from reality and the dream. And they get all mushed together. And it can really be weird ideas that you got in your head. And so, not exactly the same by any means, but Jacob is going through a pretty rough time in his life. He's stolen the birthright first from his older brother Esau. Now he has just stolen the blessing of his father Isaac from his older brother Esau. And Jacob is depicted in the Bible as kind of this, this soft kid. And his brother Esau is really a big burly guy. And Esau is none too happy with his soft gentle brother Jacob who has twice tricked him out of his blessing and his inheritance. And so Esau says, I'm going to kill that son of a gun. Now, his mother, the mother of both of them, Rebecca, she hears these words and she realizes that it's not just bluster, that Esau really is that angry that he may actually commit fratricide and kill his brother. So Jacob, she sends him away. You go back to where I came from. Go back to my family. You find a wife there. Let your brother cool down. And so that's exactly what Jacob does. He travels throughout the day. Remember, this is not a leisurely journey. He is fleeing from a really angry big brother who wants to kill him. So, you know, when you've got a brother who's out to kill you and you're on your way unexpectedly to a place unknown, well, I imagine that's a kind of heavy burden to bear. The Bible says that, you know, the place where he lays down, there's a rock there. And he puts the rock down and he uses the rock as a pillow. I, I can't imagine that this is a very comfortable night's rest. And it's during that night, with all the burdens of the day, and the physical complications of sleeping out who knows where with a rock as a pillow, that Jacob has this strange dream about a ladder that connects heaven and earth. And he sees angels going up and coming down, back and forth. And when Jacob awakens, he realizes, he says to himself, I've stumbled upon the house of God. This is the entrance to the house of God. And he calls the place Bethel. He changes the name of the place and he calls it Bethel. And Bethel in Hebrew means the house of God. And this place becomes a holy site in Israel through generations. Now, biblical archaeologists, they, they like to verify some of these things. So they go out looking and they found this site of Bethel. And you know what? It's not really all that hard to sometimes find these places because they're higher than other ones. And the reason that they're higher is that if there is a special place, like a place where Abraham and a place where Jacob maybe felt close to God, people remember that. And so if there's a, a place built there at Bethel, and then for one reason or another, say that you know the, the, the places collapse, not gonna last forever, these are stone buildings. You, so say they collapse, or say an enemy comes in and destroys the village. So what happens is you get a, a layer of rubble. But people remember this is a sacred place. They come back to the sacred place and they build on the rubble. And this happens over and over. And when you build on the rubble, you keep getting higher and higher. And in biblical archaeology, that's called tells. And so when you find one of these places that kind of rises off the plain, you can tell there's something special there. This is how they discovered 
Bethel. It just keeps going higher because it's a sacred place. So Bethel achieved this lasting memory as this place where somehow heaven and earth touch and God is there. And the gods through the ages, they changed to Bethel. It wasn't always the same God, but no matter what, what remained was this idea that this was a sacred place, that this was a, a thin place. In ancient Celtic Christian tradition, there's talk of thin places. And thin places are where that barrier between heaven and earth, it just kind of comes very thin. And you can almost feel the nearness of God. And, and so that's that idea of Bethel as a thin place. Now, now this example, it's really not the greatest example, but it's very time appropriate. You all heard this past week that Private Travis King ran across the border of the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, separating South and North Korea. So he ran across that. That is the most heavily defended border anywhere in the world. And this coming Thursday marks the 70th anniversary of the armistice that put an end to the violence of that Korean War. But it's only an armistice. It's only like, let's not shoot at each other right now. But that war is still ongoing. That border has got more guns pointed at each other than anywhere else in the world. And where that private ran across the border, that is that one place, the one place, that whole long border with guns facing both ways, it's the one place where you can meet. It was the one place where he had a chance to run out of South Korea and into North Korea for whatever reason. And so he crossed the border because that was a thin place. Everywhere else, it's impossible to cross the border, but this was a thin place in the border. So for Jacob, the fell was like that. It was a thin place where the barrier between God and his people on earth, it just kind of got so thin that you could feel the nearness of God. And so what I'd like to talk about to you, to you this morning, though, is not Bethel as a place where God once was to somebody else, but instead I'd like to think about the thin place as meeting God in unexpected places at unexpected times when we need God the most. So Jacob, just take this example. He's in terribly desperate straits. Everything that he knows, everyone who he loves is behind him. And one of them is so ticked off at him that he's ready to kill him. You know, Esau was a hunter, and Jacob is now like one hunted. And out of nowhere, in absolute desperation, with nobody to rely on, everybody is behind him, unknown is in front of him, no one to rely on. All of a sudden, God appears in this thin place. And it surprised Jacob. He was afraid because this encounter with God was so unexpected that he didn't know what to do with it. And I don't think it was a surprise to God, though. I think God knows when we are especially desperate, when we are especially alone, and there is no one else. So we have no one to touch, no one to reach out to support us. And in today's message, there's that strange wording that the Lord stood beside him. That is not a common biblical phrase that the God of everything stood beside Jacob. And God, standing beside Jacob, says, wherever you go, I will be there. So it's not a message of the place per se. It's in Bethel, this house of God, where God stood beside Jacob. And you know, that's an important message that God stood beside him wherever you go. Because when you go to these places, when you come to church, I don't know about you, but church for me is a sacred space that I need. I, you know, uh, the world is just mean out there too often. After this, I go home, I have my delightful breakfast, and I pick up the Boston Globe, and I don't know why I find that leisurely, because every time I read my newspaper, it's just so mean out there that it gets depressing. But I need a place like this, because this breaks the, the routine of everything out there that just seems so expected and so ordinary in its meanness. And then you come to church, to a sacred place, to maybe a thin place, and you can almost feel the, the closeness of God, whether it's through the music, whether it's through the stories that we share, whether it's through the community, whether it's through the beauty of the building, whatever it may be, God feels a little bit closer here. And so, Bethel is this message that there are places where you can go and touch the nearness of God or feel the nearness of God, and then God goes with you. You know, when, when Jacob left Bethel, he was a changed person. He, you know, he was 
He was a son of a gun. He, he tricked his brother twice in, in ways that really are not things that can just be erased. He was not a nice guy the way he stole from Esau what he stole twice. But now all of a sudden, in this really desperate situation, Jacob has this appearance of God to him. And God assures him, I will be with you wherever you go. And Jacob teaches because with God with him, Jacob is no longer the scared little boy. He, he grows up into a man. He comes back eventually. He meets his brother Esau. They reconcile. He sees his, his family again. He builds up and he becomes the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, the people of God, all because of Bethel, when he had no one. He found a place where the nearness of God was thin enough, where the, or the barrier between the nearness of God and us was thin enough that he could carry that with him the rest of his life. God, how I would like people could realize that church could be that thin place. That when you come here, when you break the routine, when you feel the nearness of God, it's not for an hour. You know, church is not where you come as an oasis. It's where you get strengthened by the nearness of God. But you don't leave it here. You carry it out on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays in the way that you live and the way that you react to other people. So church is that nearness of God like the fell that we carry out into the world. So in this thin place of our church worship, it's not limited to a building, although it is a sacred place. And just like Jacob's ladder, it's not limited to Bethel. In both, we experience the nearness of God that can hopefully change us. So may we relish the thin place of our gathering, and may we carry it with us throughout the week ahead so that out in the world where the weeds and the wheat grow together, where we're in competition as God's goodness against all the other things in the world, maybe that gives us the strength to be strong enough out there to make a difference. And for these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And our hymn of closing today is Blue Hymn number 515, Hymn of Promise. Thank you for joining us at worship on this Sunday, which is so much nicer this Sunday than it was last Sunday, and I do hope that you're able to enjoy the rest of today and all that it holds. 
Let us now share in our benediction and then the congregational response. We have gathered and seek in the sacred presence, and now it is time for us to go our separate ways and to serve Christ as best each of us can. Jesus promises to be with us wherever we will go, for we have been strengthened in the knowledge that surely God has been with us in this place. Let us live in ways that please God, serve the community, and fill us with gratitude. We look up from the burdens of the world with hope, patience, and joy, trusting the promises of God. So let us now go forth from this holy place to love and serve the Lord in all we do, among all whom we may meet. Amen.
Lisa, it sounded much, much better. <laughs>